Welcome to the What Drives You podcast. I'm Kevin Miller, and I produce this show to help us all continually discover where we want to go, why, and how to best get there, all the while enjoying the daily drive as much as the destinations we want to reach. In this episode, take permission to discover what you really want, not what others and the culture may want for you. I mean, this is at the heart of what drives all of us. And many of you, most of you, and I've been there too, you're driving along every day after things you haven't really agreed with. And then you wonder why you don't feel motivated and you'd rather just scroll social media or eat and drink or numb or entertain. You want to tune into stories that make you feel because you aren't getting many of the good feels from your current life. And you're in good company. Much of it isn't anything you specifically have done wrong. There's nothing really against you in your life. You probably have it pretty good. You're just somewhat aimless. And for those of you who are pretty driven and know you are, you may be tempted to say, oh, this show isn't for you. I'd ask you to stop for a minute. Uh, You may be inspired to push through your day, but how fulfilled are you really? Not just, you know, happy here and there, but really fulfilled and at peace. This is my story as well, which you're about to hear. Drive with me a bit as I come to you with some contemplation as I sit on my back deck at 9,200 feet up in the Rockies. Let's think together a bit as we hear the birds and the wind play through the aspen trees. As I talk here and you're thinking and you've got some thoughts, like to discuss it a bit, let me know. Send me an email, kmiller at kevinmiller.co. What you drive becomes the reality that you live in, your construct. We can make a better construct right here and now. So drive with me a moment as we consider what you really want. All right, friends. Well, this is a special episode and I have considered doing it for a while. So here we are. It is summertime and the Rockies. I'm at my home, not in my studio today. I'm sitting on the back deck. This is where I often do my client calls, my coaching calls with people who are really ramping up their own drive and getting it directed, uh, which you can feel free to check in with me. Send me an email at kmiller at kevinmiller.co. This is where I talk to friends and family. If they're not face-to-face with me out here on the deck, actually, if they are with me, it's out here on this beautiful deck in this pristine place. So you may hear, there you go, a plane, somebody sightseeing over the Rockies right now, or a bird. Uh, if uh, the gods are in my favor today, we'll have a bear cross behind me. Then wouldn't that be cool? But I want to talk to you about this aspect and take a contemplative moment, a curious moment. So this book, for those of you watching the video, which more and more of you guys are doing on YouTube, what drives you? This is a paperback copy. Yes, I hear that airplane. You may too. But what drives you? The impetus of this book as I sip on my tea, got a nice oolong tea here. The impetus for this book was thinking about my kids and thinking that what I most wanted for them was to know what they want and to wrap their lives around it. This isn't just, you know, working at your passions and what's fun, but what they care about, maybe what breaks their heart. I wanted to be clear on what they wanted. It was a time when I was breaking free or allowing them to break free, guiding them as their parent from the values that I had. Now, when you say that word values, you often think of like morals and ethics. So no, I wasn't saying, okay, you know what guys, you may want to, if you want to cheat and steal and murder, that's okay. We're not talking about those values, but I'm thinking the values that I have that they were raised in, they didn't ask to grow up out here in the woods. Now I think it's pristine and I busted my butt to make it possible and they all value it, but it is their highest value. I've got a bunch of kids living in Denver right now and enjoying the different perspective of a big city. And I think that's great. I want them to be free to do that. I had a kid apologize to me once for not feeling driven to be an entrepreneur at that time of their life or maybe ever. And oh, it it weighed on me and realized I have pushed that value down their throats so much. My value that I want them to have is to work at something they care about. That one son is working at something he cares about in a very large hospital in a big city. That's great. He doesn't need to be an entrepreneur. I felt bad that I was pushing that advice. I want to be free. Where do you want to live? What do you care about? What kind of relationships do you want? I've got some kids who are looking around going, dad, I had one daughter say, I love this big family. 
I adore it. It's the greatest gift of my life. And I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm not going to have that many kids. And man, I understand. Well, what about you? That's the point here. When have you stepped back and given yourself permission to consider what you want? That again was a lot of the impetus for this book. So as I took these main areas of life, really patterned after Zig Ziglar's wheel of life, you can look that up anywhere. And I went through those key areas and I started off making a case for why those areas are important. And the next piece was to step back and go, now, what do you really want? Not what your parents wanted, not what your friends and family wanted, not what the culture you grew up in wanted, not what the culture at large seems to say is important, not what your spouse wants, which I know is a dicey one because you have to take that into consideration uh, or it would be wise of you if you are in a committed relationship to consider that as well. But even there to wrap your life around what somebody else expects of you, because at the bottom of it, you're not driven. You're letting an expectation, you're letting a consequence, a possible con consequence of conflict or letting somebody down drive you. And that's not a pure and authentic drive. But I don't know if you can pick that up. That's the wind going through the aspen trees. We have some of the biggest aspen trees I've ever seen in my life here on this property. And we only get that sound part of the year because the leaves aren't there much. Oh, I hope you can hear it with me. If not, you can hear it in my smile and my heart. So looking at these areas and saying, what do I really want? So walk with me, drive with me. Actually, you know what? Sit with me. I'm sitting right now. I'm not driving. I have drive in my heart, but I'm sitting here with you. And let's just talk through them. It's chapter three, actually, in my book, part, part two. It's called Driving Lessons. That's after driving school where I make a case for drive. But it starts off and says, what drives your purpose? You are what you have faith in. And the concept is spirituality. And I do. I make a case that it has been one of the most paramount values of mankind. And if so, we should look at it. Doesn't mean religion. It doesn't mean somebody else's specific faith, but it means spirituality. And basically the tenet of that is believing in something greater than, in, than yourself or devoting yourself to something greater than you. So looking at spirituality, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Tama Bryant is the president of the APA, the American Psychological Association. And one of her values that she brought in to her time as president, where she is currently, is spirituality. She said, here we have trying to serve humanity through psychology. And one of the greatest tenets of humanity is spirituality. And if we don't include that, we're missing a key component of their life, of their drive, of their motive, of their personal faith. Again, there's my case. But what do you think about spirituality? How are you driven there? I find most people are driven somewhat blindly by a religion that they have confined themselves to. Now, I'm not saying religion is all bad. I grew up in a very staunch Christian religion in the Bible Belt of America. I still retain a faith in Jesus Christ, not just as some great guy, but actually as a, as a deity. That is my decision. That is my faith. It's my choice. a lot of you have been burned by religion. And so a lot of people I find on polarized sides, they either blindly embrace it, don't question it, or they have rejected it. Neither one is a healthy drive. They're both responsive, reactive, really. And so if you just look and go, huh, if I look at my guests, 260 plus, 270 plus, the most influential people on the planet on my show, the majority have a clear devotion to something greater than themselves that's at the core of their drive that they would call spirituality, that I would call spirituality. And if we just look at that at the value and say, that's interesting, what do I devote myself to? What is taking me beyond just staring at myself in the mirror, thinking that it's all about me or it's all up to me and looking to the world at large and something that I hold on to dear? If that's a value, what is it that you hold dear? But what is it that you hold dear? You may 
be well served to step back and give yourself permission to step outside of a church or your faith, to question it at least. I feel like anything that you're actually confident in, you're also willing to question to a great degree. I spent so much of my life not even allowing myself to engage with anything outside of my specific religion. Kept myself really confined. Almost felt like I was betraying my faith to consider other faiths and what they believed in. And as I've done it, it's done nothing but expand and deepen my own faith. Do you need to give yourself permission to take a break from a religion, to step outside and consider some other spirituality aspects? Do you need to give yourself faith to engage in them? Have you been in a culture that just talked negatively about religion and faith, and yet you have a curiosity and you'd like to give yourself the permission to step in, go visit a church, go visit a, uh, a place of worship, go consider, buy a book on spirituality. Again, if any of these, I'm not going to take the time to list out resources, but if you'd like some, I'm ecstatic to share. Again, email me, kmeller at kevinmiller.co. But give yourself permission. You may need to give yourself a permission, some permission to just take a break from your spiritual pursuit now, again, I'm making a case and holding it up as high value, but we're looking at what would serve your drive right now? What would give you peace? What would help you go, oh my goodness, yes. And again, I found people so often, including myself in all three of those areas going, oh my gosh, yes, I've really wanted to be curious and investigate something, attend that church or go to that spiritual function. And I'm going to let myself do it and quit worrying about if it offends somebody or if I'm going to offend God. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Or the opposite. I am so grateful. You know what? To just not go to church today, to take a rest day. I'm using those as examples, whatever it works for you or the permission to, you know what? Right now, I'm just going to let it go. I'm just going to let it go. I just need a breather. I need a breather. It's like maybe you might need to fast from spirituality. How uh, counterintuitive is that? fast from spirituality. Our, our bodies and minds can usually take, be well served, take a break from just about anything except sleep. I think sleep and water don't take a break from anything else. You generally give yourself a little benefit by taking a little break. All right. Chapter four. It's the next one. Number two, though, what drives your relationships? You are who you love relationships. And I will use my kids as a muse, as I often do, since I have nine of them. And they're ever present in my life. Actually, I only have two at the house right here, right now, today. Some of them are at school already. But relationships, you know, as I looked to them, some of them look and go, you know what? Can't wait to have kids. Some of them look and go, you know what? I don't know if I'll ever have kids. And that is great. I'm glad they've had exposure to other people. Their godparents are a couple who have no kids. They've obviously invested in my kids, but they chose other things. I mean, that's a good one there that we often, especially in this American culture, I think worldwide, we look at marriage and having children as an absolute expectation. I value it, but my goodness, I have seen now people, I've been fortunate enough to meet people who have never married and have led incredibly fulfilling lives they have not experienced something in that devoted union. They'll miss out on that and they will participate in other things that those of us who have done the committed relationship haven't been able to do. And I've seen that with people then who do not, who, who do maybe come together, but then don't have children and they will miss out on some miracles of life, some gifts of life. And I realize I missed out on some of the miracles and gifts that they have gotten the time to invest in that I'm just not going to, to that level, their, their involvement in other people's lives and other ventures. And even just the time, the contemplative time while I was changing diapers and running kids to school and soccer practice that they're devoting. It's a different lifestyle. Talk about a contemplative lifestyle. That's my heart. I've infringed on that a lot with the size of my family. There's been big pros and cons for me that I wasn't open to till now. I'm 53 and there's pros and there's cons. If you ask me if I think you should have kids, I don't know. Should you have a big family? Oh, I mean, that's, that's a specific, uh, 
that's like saying, should you be an astronaut to me? I don't know. That's it's some pros and cons to that one. There is to everything. And yet we uphold these things as shoulds and expectations. What do you want for relationships? What do you want for friends? We see things depicted on TV and shows and think that we should have these friends that are a certain way, that look and feel a certain way, and we do certain things, and we should have a certain number. We should have a bosom buddy. We should have lots of friends. What's the answer? I don't know. It depends on you. The only one who will ever know is you and understanding what gives you energy at the end of the day. Not just what's all fun and happy and easy, but what gives you energy. I don't get energy by lots and lots of people. I do get energy. Hear that plane right there? That's somebody flying over the Rockies looking at the glory and the beauty down below that I'm sitting in right now. I hope they see my little tent here and know something important's happening. My little awning, umbrella. But how many friends? I don't know. What gives you energy? Mine comes from fewer and deeper relationships. That's where I get energy. What gives you energy? Look at your relationships. Look at what's happened so far and look at where you've really found life and inspiration and where you don't and get clear on that. This is where we're looking for permission to pursue that. Chapter five, but it's actually number three on the wheel here. What drives your body? How are you? You are how you look and you feel. I separated those. Look and feel. Look and feel. (laughs) God bless whoever's flying up there. They're just flying around, checking out the territory. All right. Hey, this is candid. I'm going to let it roll. But look at your body, health and wellness, how you look, how you feel. Those are two different things. And I separated it on purpose. How do I want to feel? Now, if I look at my age, 53, I see these memes here and there posted about, oh my gosh, you know, I'm 30 years old and I can't do what I used to do. I'm thinking 30? And I'm out here in Colorado in the Rockies. I see people who are 80, sometimes 90 doing things that they've always done. They're still doing it. Now, I'm not minimizing anybody's specific issues. I'm questioning a little bit, but how do you want to feel? Man, do not take the cultural approach. I highly warn you with the expectation that by the time you're 30 or 40 or 50 or 60, whenever, that you just can't do much. That's not based on an age. That's based on wear and tear, lack of use. That's harsh. Some people don't want to hear that. We don't want responsibility for that. Uh, There's too much proof to show and believe otherwise, I believe, I, I feel. So how do you want to feel? And if so, you're going to have to do some things, but how do you want to feel? And it could be, again, we're looking at freedom for myself and for some of you athletes out there and people who push really hard. I have worked lately to give myself permission not to get another PR, not to lift the heaviest weights I've ever lifted, not to go push and suffer. Man, I've done that so much. I'm trying to give my pers- myself permission to chill out some. Now, I still enjoy pushing hard here and there, but I'm trying to give myself permission the other way. Not because I'm not able, but I want to experience some different things. I want my drive to be a drive to notice and feel, see around me, check out the high mountain lake I'm riding by, not just blow past at 100 miles an hour. Again, we're looking at what gives you energy and it's going to change. Let me put that out there for all these. It's going to change. Shouldn't it? Shouldn't you evolve? Does it make the same or make the make sense that you want the exact same now as same things now as you did when you were a kid? That your desires, your 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 uh, appetites have never changed. You always like the same flavor. Nothing changes, no matter what. Again, if that gives you joy and energy, that's fine. I'm not I'm not judging anyway. I'm just trying to give you permission to step back. So, do you need permission to quit working out every day and killing yourself? Do you need permission to go try something that you may think a friend or a family member may kid you about? Oh, you're going to yoga now, huh? You're one of those woo-woo people. Oh my goodness. The things we limit ourselves from because of what other people might think. We, I included me in there. I've done it. I don't feel like I do it much these days. I probably do it more than I think I do though. Then how about how you look? 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that one. We know the cultural expectations around how we look. But again, I see people feeling pressured either way. They feel pressured to be in shape. They feel pressured to not get in shape. I've seen Lori Harder. I talk about her in my book, Lori, L-O-R-I. She's gotten uh, really popular these days as a leader and an influencer. That's her story. That's why I write about her in her book. Her pressure she had from her sedentary family to remain sedentary with them was so big. And so a big part of her story then and now is to break free and allow herself to be the fit, able, capable, beautiful woman that she is and wants to be. It's still a part of her story. She wakes up and I think still feels that pressure from her family. She may still have disdain from some of them. How about your friends and family? What are they pressuring you from? That's a good thing to get tuned in on. What do you need to give yourself freedom to pursue? I only caution I would give there is, you know, freedom to go, you know what? I, I'm tired of working out and all this being in shape. I'm just going to eat hot pockets and sit on the couch for the next year. That's probably not going to help your overall drive and health and wellness. But what if you need a time? I've known some people who have been blessed by giving themselves a little time to let go and just uh, put things down. I don't find that they stay happy long after that, but it may help them come to a place of some better balance with their health and wellness pursuits, the pressures that they feel, the judgment and the guilt that they feel around it. I really call people in my book to step back and it's, it's, a, it's, diff- it's almost impossible to do, but go with me on the concept to look in the mirror and go, what do you want for you? If nobody else was around in essence, or if everybody had to wear a big burlap sack and a mask and you couldn't see how anybody looked, you couldn't see what their body looked like, how would you want to look and feel to yourself? Because for myself, even if nobody could see me, I just want to be able I want to be able to run and walk and jump and hike and climb and kayak. And I, I enjoy those things. And I really, above all that, I just want my brain to work well and realizing that my brain cannot work and function separate from my body. So if my body's not well, my brain is not well. If I'm walking slower up the steps with my body, my brain is walking slower up the steps of my critical thinking and my creativity. So what do you want for you? Chapter six is actually number four. What drives your mind, your mental state? You are how you think and feel. This is one that I really look at and I like that concept of mental state. What kind of mental state do you want? What do you, what do you want? Do you want to be scatterbrained? That was one that weighed on me. I got the term from my family a little bit, kind of like the absent-minded professor. And you know what I felt? Initially, a little pride. Oh yeah, I am so brilliant. I got a high, IQ. I don't have that high of an IQ, but you know, I'm thinking in my mind, I'm so smart. I got so many ideas happening up here, man. This is just like a, this is just like a factory of ideas and thoughts and contemplation. And because of that, I can't keep track of anything around me. And I'm the absent-minded professor who shows up at my office with two different pairs of shoes. I did that once. And honestly, at that point, I looked down and I thought, is this really what I want? Am I proud of that, to be that unpresent, to be that scatterbrained? I don't really want that. I want to have creative skills, creative and critical thinking skills. I want to be innovative and decisive. I want to have all the emotions. I want to have all my mental capacities, but I don't want to be going a thousand miles a minute scatterbrained, forgetting everything, not hearing people? Is that really, is that what I revere? And that was the other way. Do I want to hang out with that person? That's what got me. No, I don't. I want to hang out with the person who's sitting across from me and they're with me. Their eyes are on mine. They're considering what I have to say. That takes a person who's present, who's at peace, who's respectful, who's interested and curious in another person. Man, that's what we all, uh, you, you, you name it for yourself. I won't, I won't put my shit on you. Uh, what do you want? Or do you enjoy that? Do you enjoy sitting next to the person who can't give you their attention because they're going a thousand miles a minute? Again, what do you want? What calls to you? What are you comfortable with, with other people? And what do you want for yourself? Mental health is a big issue. I find for the most part, 
just like health and wellness though, we're doing it to ourselves. I know I am and I have had issues guys. Years back, I went through a time, I told my buddy, Randy, the doctor, I said, dude, I am having a hard time containing myself. I had some really hard life issues going on and I tried some, uh, uh, some meds, uh, well, like a Zoloft type thing. It didn't help me or I didn't feel a difference from it, but it was still a call to action to go and, okay, I'm not suffering here because my brain has a lack of Zoloft. I'm taking Zoloft because I am not containing myself. What am I fearing? What's the threat that I perceive? Where's this lack of peace coming from? And I made changes and I continue to make changes. What's the mental state that you want to be in? What kind of mental well-being do you want? I want to be at peace. I want to be thoughtful, contemplative. I want to be aware. I want to be insightful. I want to be intuitive, discerning. I want to be loving. I want people to be drawn to me. I want them to feel that I care about them. Why do I want those things? Because I'm selfish. And I want their respect and I want their love. And I'm not going to get it by proving what a rock star I am. I'm going to get it by helping them know what a rock star they are. Man, that's not my inclination. I'm a self-centered dude. What kind of mental state do I want? Do I want to exude to others? I literally do. Let's be selfish. My persona, what do I want? I want you to think that I'm at peace. Because that's what I respect and revere. Well, that's a hard act to act like you're at peace. Pretty much the only way to come off like you're at peace is to be at peace. So there's the work I've got cut out for me. Chapter seven, fifth spoke here on this wheel. What drives your work? You are what you do. That's how we think about it, isn't it? How do you want to feel about your work? Is it just about what others think? Man, talk about a freedom. This is a big one. I talk about in the book, you know, are you the high flying executive in the C-suite with all the fancy accoutrements that at heart would love to just go be an artist, go travel and explore, go be contemplative, go sit on a mountain for a month. And yet you feel the pressure to maintain this persona you've created. Or are you the opposite? You're the artist over here doing all these creative things and you've got your people around you who applaud that. And secretly, you'd love to go to law school. Love to go back to school, get a degree in something or get licensed in something or do something technical. What is it? What are you not letting yourself do? Not allowing yourself to consider. Do you want to own a business? Do you want to do something freely that requires you to own a business, but you don't really want to own a business. You're the reluctant entrepreneur. I just did a show on that. I've come to realize after the, a lifetime of being an entrepreneur that in some ways I'm almost a reluctant businessman, at least. I don't enjoy running businesses, maintaining them, doing those things. I just want to do my art. I want to do what I do. And so to do it in the capacity and the freedom and the autonomy uh, pretty much requires me to be an entrepreneur. So I do that and then I suffer the other sides of that, but I do it willingly and know, I know the score now. I understand that. Or do you not? Do you feel pressured like my kids? I shared that. Have to be an entrepreneur, to be a business owner, because that's the culture you grew up in and you don't want to. You want a job that's consistent, that you can count on. It's predictable. You have structure laid out for you and you get to, to just address what's what's easily known, not you know what's what's what you can conceive of, and then do it with excellence. Man, that's hard for me to do a lot of things with excellence because I'm an entrepreneur. And I got a lot of hats that I'm wearing. I could see that somebody who wants to do their thing and not think about anything else. I had a nutritionist at our clinic one time, and she was doing a lot of, or she had the capacity to do a lot of things that we really didn't need in the office. And I said, oh my gosh, let's get you a website up there and let you go do your thing and get you clients. They'll probably, you'll probably make more. Uh, and she said, I just don't want to. She said, I like coming in here. You guys have my patients booked out for me. I sit down, I do what I do and what I know with excellence. And then I leave and I leave it at the desk, leave it in the office. 
and I go out and I'm free to do my life. And that's what gave her energy. Man, power to her clarity on that. What do you feel pressured by? What would give you energy? You may not know. You may not have ever experienced it in your work. A finding purpose in your work. I don't know if there's anything that will serve you more. Does that mean, what does that mean? It means whatever gives you purpose. Saving the world or doing something fun that you enjoy and have a knack for. I could go through a thousand examples. I've done plenty of shows on work. But this is about looking at it and giving yourself permission to step back. Give yourself permission with all these to think, oh my gosh, what it just drains you. And what would excite you? And you may not know, you may need to go expose yourself to some other job type opportunities, career opportunities, because you don't know. You never experienced anything that really inspired you. Now, when I say inspire, again, it could be that thing you're passionate about. It could be the thing that breaks your heart. I've been involved in both. I am involved in both today. I hold both of those together, passion and breaking my heart in what I do. But think about your emotions with all these. Where are the aspects of your life that you're rolling your eyes and going, oh my gosh, is how you feel, even if you're containing it. And where would give you that opportunity to go, oh my gosh, take a deep breath. Or the opposite. <gasps> yes. How about a big intake of breath? Yes. Oh my gosh, I would kill to have that opportunity or to consider that, to just let myself be free to consider X. Again, here's one of the historically least emotionally intelligent people I've ever known, me. All right, there's the admission. And yet I'm calling you to consider your emotions here as we talk through these. Chapter eight, which is actually number six on the wheel. What drives your money? You are what you have and don't have, right? What drives your money? How do you feel about money? Again, where do you feel the pressures? I don't know the stats. I've looked at them before, but generally we maintain the same socioeconomic level that we grew up in. We just embrace that and we accept it and we don't question it. Or we rebel against it. Grew up in poverty. I hate that. I'm going to go make a billion dollars. That's okay. We want to question the drive of it. We want to question what is compelling you? Is it a negative emotion or a positive? A negative one can be good fuel as far as driving you, but it often has collateral damage. So even looking at your motives at the core for these is very important of all of these. But to look at your money and finances and how you view that, do you, again, would it be just, oh my gosh, could I just downsize? I've talked to a lot of people, even people my age, which again, I'm 53, who are deciding, I just want simplicity. I don't want to have all this stuff. I mean, what you own does own you, which some people, that's great. For me, it's not. I get so tired of tinkering with stuff. I was a pro cyclist. My kids don't ride bikes much. You know why? I had so many kids. I don't like working on bikes. And you got that many bikes around. There's always something wrong with them. Like, forget this. Can we be runners? Just wear shoes, kayakers. We do that. I got a whole fleet of kayaks and canoes. We do that. I don't have to maintain those things. We camp. Now that does take a little maintenance, but not too bad. You get the point. What gives you energy? But the more stuff you have, it does require dealing with it. I do know so many wealthy men and the time that they spend messing with their second and third homes and their five cars and their boats and their toys and whatnot. I go, oh my gosh, it's, it's not worth it to me. I'd rather rent the stuff when I have it. I thought about that at some point. I thought, oh, I want homes in all the places I love to visit. There'll be investments. We can rent them out, VRBO, all that kind of Airbnb. And then I finally realized I don't want to mess with it. Even if you have a management company, it's still something to deal with at the end of the year. It's something else for the CPA to have to figure out and question about. I don't want it. I'd rather just go rent those things that we want to have for the fun times, but money. Now, again, you're here in my, I'm giving you my bias and it's just, it's it. It's my choices. It's what gives me energy. What gives you energy? How do you feel about money? I do want to pull that out to really look at this. I feel it will help you to understand how you feel about money. I had Ken Honda on my show. He wrote the book, Happy Money, and really looks at the emotions of money. He endorsed my book. Matter of fact, he's on the back cover. 
And that will do a lot to help you understand how you feel about money. And then what do you want? Do you get security from having a lot of money, really? Or do you just feel pressured to have a lot of money because of other people? Do you feel more security and peace and calm by not having a ton to, to mess with, just having enough? Again, you're going to hear that and go, well, that's not why you're going to put all the cultural expectations on there. And I can give you success stories from about every different scenario that I've seen. At the end of the day, we got to look at what is it that you're wired to find joy in, to find peace in, to have good energy from, in this case, regarding money. How do you feel about it? Chapter nine and the seventh and last spoke here that I look at, though I am going to give you an extra one after this. Okay, hold on. But in the book, it's what drives your achievements. When we really do care about the things that we have done. And I talk in here in the book and you hear it from so many people. Oh my gosh. She's one of the most referenced people that I know. Authors, Bronnie Ware. B-R-O-N-N-I-E, Bronnie Ware. She's an Australian hospice nurse. And she wrote the book, The Five Regrets of the Dying. We like our achievements. And one of the key regrets that she listed out is we regret the things we didn't do. We regret the things we didn't try. And this isn't about doing things again, just to chalk them up on your list and hang them on your wall and brag to people. I want to think about it in the way, again, of what if there's nobody else around? Nobody's ever going to see it. It's just you and you alone. If you can't tell anybody, what would make you proud of you? I was just in Leadville, Colorado, a week ago, and they had the Leadville 100. It's a 100-mile mountain bike race. And then the next week, I think that's this this, a couple days from as I'm recording right now, is the Leadville run. They run 100 miles. It's a long ways. How many of those people did that to brag about it? How many of those people did it just to prove something to themselves? There's people that did that. They don't have friends. They don't have family. Nobody's going to know. They did it for them. They did it for the satisfaction that it gave them. Think about it in that way. What are the achievements? You want to look around and go, I did that. Could be, I, I got married. I had kids. I raised kids. I kept myself fit. I lost a hundred pounds. I know a lady who did that just recently. I lost a hundred pounds. I did that for myself. I yeah, ran a marathon, whatever. I got a college degree. I started a business. I faithfully worked at a place for 20 years and gave great value and served and loved customers and employees well. I, I don't know what that achievement is for you. But I look now at the achievements that I look towards and go, well, that served me well. How do I feel about that? For me, an easy one to pull on to, to showcase the point, is athletic events. So I was a pro cyclist. I have competed and I did the numbers one time. I have started and I have paid for, start, gotten on the starting line and taken off in over a thousand athletic events bike races and running races primarily, do athlons, things like that. I have done that. It's a part of my self-image. I'm proud of it. And yet as time goes on, most years I'll think, oh, I'm going to do all these. And then I'll realize a lot. I don't feel like it. I don't need the motivation to go out and do a long run or a long ride or a hard run or a hard ride or whatever. And I just don't even feel it. I feel like I should. In my own head, I'm shooting on myself. I should do it because that's who Kevin is, right? I don't have to do that. And then the day comes when I go, oh, you know what? I am kind of feeling it. I'll jump in one and do it. So I let myself, I give myself permission. That's the point of this show. To look at the achievements that give me joy and sometimes realize that I'm going after achievements and going, man, I'm feeling pressure. It's draining me to think about this. I'm not looking forward to it. Well, it's worth looking at. I'm not just going to let my feelings control everything, but I'm going to pay attention to them and go, why is that? And I may look at it and figure out that there's something eating at me that I can get rid of. And then I'd still go forward toward the thing. Or I may realize, oh my gosh, yeah, I'm doing this for the wrong reasons. I'm not feeling the energy. I don't see the payoff. And I'm going to give myself permission not to do that. And I've had years where I was in one event. This year, 
And I have to think about that. I know I did one event. Now I did two. I did two, two little running races just for fun. No big, massive endeavor. And I probably won't. Not feeling it right now. So what are the achievements though? What are the things you've never let yourself do? Or are there achievements you're going after consistently or one big one and you realize, man, it's, you're doing it. What are the reasons? Looking at the why. Why are you doing it? What are you trying to feel? What's the, what's the feeling at the end? This is a, a I'm going to give you a, a concept that's difficult for me sometimes to consider. Uh, it's a little daunting to consider that so often if we look at that, let me take, let me take that Leadville 100 last week. I saw people, I went to the finish of it, watch people coming through who had just ridden hundred miles for the most part, seeing joy in their face. Some of them, it was agony, but looking at that and looking at how do they feel at the end of it? Are they inspired? Or are they just so freaking glad that it's over? Did they do it to prove something to themselves or again, to prove to somebody else? What was the purpose in it? And here's what really gets me. At the end of it, they had a feeling. Now it's over. They came across the finish line. They had a feeling right then. That night, they had a feeling about it. Over the next few days, they have a feeling about what they accomplished, okay? Okay. But then life goes on. It's over, forgotten about. Look at all the effort that they went through for a feeling that they could have possibly just manufactured by sitting down and meditating and considering a feeling of euphoria and accomplishment. It's a little daunting to think we're doing all this stuff just to manufacture a feeling that some people are able to get by meditating and taking 15 minutes an hour, whatever it takes them to enter into a mental state, a mental construct. Now I want to put that point out there. It's not totally fair. Somebody who did the Leadville 100, they were getting feelings every day and it added to their health and wellness, hopefully, and their overall inspiration day after day of doing what they did to train and whatnot. But that concept of at the end of the day, we're, we're doing something for a feeling. And to think right now, if you're looking towards a big, let's say going back to school, getting another degree, you're going to spend that time and that money for what? What is the end goal? Now, it may be, oh, I just need X certificate to go do X. I mean, that's just, you know, one plus one equals two. But to think about whatever achievement you're going after, you're doing it to create a feeling. Is it worth it? Is it needed? I have definitely known people to pick on formal education who have gone after it in an area, formal education in an area, they did not need to. And I personally questioned, is that the best place to get that type of training? There's places to get that in the private sector where you'll pay less money and or get better training. And yet I realize with some people, it's the going through the formal process and getting the actual college certificate degree, whatever, that they needed and they needed it just for their own self-confidence. It was just playing a mind game. Now I'm not discounting that, but I like to know the score. And so if that was me, I'd say, you know what, I'm going to go spend the money and the time here doing this. I could probably get the same training elsewhere, but I want it just because it helps my own confidence. Okay. Fair enough. Let's be honest. That will help the energy and the motive at the end of the day. And that's what we're talking about when we're not clear on what it is we actually want and what the why is behind it, the reason, the motive to what's driving us. When we're not clear, that's when we find ourselves drained of energy. We don't understand it. We think we should be excited about this. We should be happy because of all this. And we're not. And it's because we're not clear on what we really want and why. That is the focus of my book. There you go. You don't even have to buy the book. Now, if you want to, it'll help you work through things. It'll give you a, a lot of stories that will connect and resonate. The end of the chapters all give work, uh, things to work through and consider and questions to answer. Somebody, a lot of people have said it's like a workbook as well. So it will do that. It'll help you. But a lot of the concept is right there. 
some of you will be helped to go through the book and look at some of the, what I call the things that are going to derail you, the detours, the Sabbath, the saboteurs that often derail us in our efforts. And that helps too, but you get the concept right here, right now, understanding what it is that you want, giving yourself permission to look and think and consider beyond what the culture has expected of you. A lot of the agreements that you've made with your life and your lifestyle and your pursuits, you've agreed unconsciously. You just accepted it. That's one of the saving graces. It feels like one of the great joys of being a father now to my older kids is getting to talk with them through this. Again, I wrote this with them in mind and they've all got copies and to talk them through and go, what do you guys value? You know, I don't have one kid that's a pro athlete. I don't have one. Now all my kids have done athletics to some degree. And so here we are with my, let's see, how old's my youngest kid? She's 12. She is not going to pursue professional athletics unless some lightning bolt comes out and knocks her silly. And that will mean I have no kids who do that. I live about 20 miles from the Olympic training center in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I just figured, oh my gosh, man, I'm well equipped to teach a kid to be a pro athlete. We got the Olympic training center right down there. That's going to be fun. And I didn't though, as I look at it, do I want that lifestyle for them? Do I want to support that lifestyle as a parent to train them up that way and to have them invest to that degree? I don't know. But a saving grace is getting to ask them that and look at that. You know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll give one more thought on being a parent. Is it, does it say more about me if all nine of my kids are entrepreneurs, all nine of my kids are authors, podcasters, influencers, if you will, all nine kids are professional athletes. Does that say more about me and my acumen as a parent? Or does it say more if each of them is doing different things? Obviously, I set that up with a bias because as I look at it now, there was a time when I thought they should all be doing the same thing. And then I backed up when I realized they weren't made that way. They're not all like me. There's values that they have that I align with and I'm grateful that they have. They're honest people. I trust my kids. I feel safe with my kids. They're honest. They care about other people. Man, I couldn't want anything more. But outside of that, man, their interest and desires. Actually, no, that's not clear. That's not fair. They're pretty much all foodies for the most part. <laughs> There's a couple of them that aren't really high on the foodie list. But, eh, they all appreciate food. For the most part, they're all foodies. Uh, and I do appreciate that. That's fun. Love music. They all love music. But those things outside of that, their lifestyles and their pursuits and their relationships and what they want to do with work and money is so varied. And I'm grateful that they have permission. That's what I want most of all for you as you listen to this, to have permission to think through these concepts. Okay. Thanks for walking with me today. Well, friends, thanks for sitting with me today out on my back deck as the birds chirp and the grasshoppers flit around and the wind blows through the aspen trees and the sightseeing airplanes fly overhead. Uh, I appreciate that. For those of you watching the video, I hope it was enjoyable to see those things happening uh, behind me. I don't think unless it went by and I didn't see it, I didn't see a bear, but I appreciate you being with me. I'm honored that you would find value in this show. And as I've talked through some deep things, some meaningful things, again, is if you want to engage on any of it, if you want to ask for a resource, have a question, I'd be honored to engage with you. Send me an email, kmiller at kevinmiller.co. Until next time, I hope this episode helps you drive further and enjoy the ride. And for this one, also maybe sit down and contemplate what you want and why. Thanks so much for joining me on this journey. I look forward to meeting you in the Drive Tribe community for ongoing discussions about each episode. You can subscribe to the Drive Drop newsletter for weekly updates. Find it all at kevinmiller.co along with all our social media and video clips. Until next time, I hope this episode helps you drive further and enjoy the ride.